Right, thank you very much. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the first 13 minutes of my talk. Presumably, I haven't given an extension to make up for. Yes. Well, first of all, I'd just say a little, little bit about my real interest in this, because um, I uh, was uh, a few years ago on the uh, Local Education Authority Scrutiny Committee uh, when there was a, a request from the Muslim population uh, in Oxford to have its own school. I mean, there was a very interesting debate, and I got in touch very much with then Dr. Ramsey, I hope, who would be here today, who was really responsible for the Icon School up in uh, North uh, <coughs> in, um, East Oxford. Uh, and I've been working for many years at the Aga Khan University with the Institute for Soviet Muslim Civilizations in London. So I just find I'm very grateful to be able to, uh, to be uh, here. Um, I just want to say something about that uh, meeting of the scrutiny committee, because it was a time when Oxford had uh, six uh, high schools, and they were uh, 13 to 18 high schools, there were six, and one was an all-girls school. And many of the uh, Muslim population, especially East Oxford, would send their daughters uh, to that school. They wanted to single sex education, as indeed that was traditional for many people in this country up to about 30 years ago, 20 years ago. But when they uh, reduced six schools to five schools, they closed the girls' school. They made them 11 to 18 schools. And then that gave the, uh, and then there was the, a lot of the Muslim uh, schools then went to what was then a joint Church of England Roman Catholic school, St. Augustine's. Uh, and um, I was uh, brought onto the governing body of that, uh, brought onto the governing body. But then, and, and that school then had, uh, when it was a, a Catholic head teacher, it was a Church of England chairman of the governors, and vice versa. And it worked very effectively. A lot of the Muslims moved over to that school because they wanted a school that had a certain faith atmosphere. And the school really was very good at accommodating different religious groups and so on, making sure everything was okay and so on. But then when they moved to a 13 to 18 school, the Archdiocese of Birmingham decided that we wanted a pure Catholic school, Roman Catholic school. And I objected to this, and I went to see the Archbishop in Birmingham and said, look, it's wrong, here's a school that really brings people together and much needed and so on. But anyway, it, then I found myself <clears throat> um, off the government body for being an unsafe Catholic. Uh, but it didn't matter when it created the pure Catholic school, St. Gregory's, uh, the local education authority put me on as a, as a, as a good state socialist. So the, the archbishop couldn't really get away from me. Anyway, there we are. But what I put here, here was a school that really did bring people together and created that sort of faith uh, atmosphere that uh, with, with, uh, made people feel very contented. So what I want to do is a little bit about the context, and then as it fits this institution set out my thesis, and then the antithesis, uh, and then I go a synthesis. Uh, well, just in terms of the context, um, for those who are not aware of this, if you take the 1944 Education Act, that was uh, the creation of what we call maintained schools, not state schools. And I have been possibly the only person now in the country who refuses to re use the word state school. They were maintained schools. The uh, Fourth War Education Act, the Butler Act, said we need schools, but they're not to be run by my great friend Marjorie Reeves, who died not too long ago, in 98, who was on the Central Advisory Council for Education in 1947. I used to treat her every night until she died. Uh, she, um, she was uh, asked the permanent secretary at that time. <coughs> What is the main job of uh, uh, to be a member of the advisory council set up in the Fourth War Education Act? And uh, Rector Moore, the permanent secretary, said it is to be prepared to die at the first ditch as soon as politicians get their hands on education. I want to say the Fourth War Education Act was said schools are too important to be in the hands of politicians. Uh, and when I joined the civil service in 1962 at the Ministry of Education. It was a great thing to protect, as it were, schools from politicians. Now, under the 44 Education Act, there maintained schools. There were really three kinds of schools. There were the community schools, and then there were the voluntary aided and the voluntary controlled. And the Church of England opted for the voluntary controlled, and the Roman Catholics for the voluntary aided. And so one was able to have one state school, but within the system, maintained by the local authority. There were penalties to pay for the privilege of being 
voluntary control of body aid. In terms of money that you have to lay out and find as the Catholic community and so on in order to build these schools. But basically, there were these different schools, and the whole system worked very well. Subject to national inspectorate, to local government inspectorate, uh, to the curriculum, uh, broadness, and all those kind of things. And it worked very well. Uh, now, I want to say something then about the present condition. <clears throat> the present condition is now, uh, it's uh, choice and diversity, John Patton's old uh, white paper, or by others, chaos and anarchy. Uh, and what we've got now <coughs> is the development of the free schools, the academies, and so on. What we've got to remember about these, and this is a point that's never coming out because of the weakness of the opposition, is that these now are state schools. Each one of these free schools and the academies, and that's where the government's pushing, are contracted directly to the person of the Secretary of State with minimum parliamentary accountability. <coughs> In other words, we are now developing possibly the most centralized system of education ever known in Western Europe outside Germany in the 1930s. And this is something which we ought to be very, very frightened of and makes, I think, this sort of debate all the more important. How can we preserve that independence from the whim of a Secretary of State? And that's the kind of uh, context which uh, we are in. So my thesis is, and it's one which I would like to nuance quite a lot, uh, is yes, we ought to be able to have uh, schools uh, that are that reflect the values, uh, the particular educational aims of particular communities, and uh, in, in this particular case, I think, uh, faith communities. The 1998 uh, Human Rights Act spells it out in the exercise of any functions which it assumes in relationship to education and to teaching. The state shall respect the rights of parents to ensure such education and teaching in conformity with their own religious and philosophical convictions. Uh, and I think one, certainly when I was on that scrutiny committee uh, of the uh, local education authority, the real concern from a lot of people in the Muslim community was that their families would now, some of them would no longer be sending their children to school uh, because they were only prepared to send them to schools where there would be uh, single sex education. I think they're right for that, and so they, I feel that their human rights would be denied by what uh, was, was occurring. And so, one of the reasons why I would be in favour of faith schools is they do reflect certain sorts of values which it is consonant with the, as they see it, supporting uh, their community and their families, uh, particular, uh, that particular example, those of you other, one might argue, and this was certainly coming from the Muslim community, why they'd like to go to the St. Augustine school, was they felt there was an atmosphere which was not anti-religion, was not thoroughly secular. And of course, if we see the increasing secularization of society, you can see how people would like that kind of thing. And so, in a way, uh, I don't want to really show uh, too much support for the big society vis-a-vis Mr. Cameron's uh, things, but of course, if you trace that, and I have done, it goes back, though he's made some crucial omissions, via the thing called ill meeting, uh, which takes place in uh, Italy every year, which goes back rooted in the early 13th year of the Barham, about the importance of society is not an aggregate of individuals, but is much more an aggregate of different kinds of social groups, their different sort of values, and so on. And we need a society that will be able to respect those sort of differences. So, and hence the schooling system that is, uh, reflects those differences. Now, that's the thesis. The antithesis is, look, in the sort of society which we have today, we really need the common school. And recently I produced a book of my great hero, uh, John Dewey, which is really an argument for the common school. Do we argue we need a common school because otherwise we're going to have a society that is at loggerheads with each other. It's through the common school that we come to recognize and respect people from different traditions, different values, 
And we, if it's a well-run uh, kind of school, then indeed we begin, <coughs> we, they learn from each other. Your uh, Christian faith gets strengthened by having to sort of see it against the <coughs> background, the objections, and so on of other people. And certainly with, uh, when I was running the department of Oxford, doing a lot of interviews around the schools and seeing the six, talking to the six forms at Oxford School as it was then, where a whole group of six formers, including uh, uh, some uh, Muslim uh, girls, some uh, Christians, atheists, one thing, to how much they valued doing their six form work together, how they benefited from each other. And it was a very strong case that they uh, were, were put in for their common school. And that was a school also that actually produced a humanities option course that fitted in with that uh, the, the, the background to the Muslim uh, is, the Islam faith, back to the medieval period, the philosophers, uh, the poets, the uh, aesthetic tradition, and, and so on. Uh, that also made sure there was opportunity five times uh, during the day for prayers, uh, for uh, and so on. So a school could organise if had minded to create those sort of things. So this is the antithesis, and certainly you could people can point to Northern Ireland where uh, you could say, is not the separation of the Catholic from the uh, Protestant part of the sort of problem? One goes back to the Usley report in the Bradford riots about 10 or more years ago, where one says one of the kind of problems is you've got these uh, totally separate communities. Surely, if we're going to have cohesion and solidarity in our society, they've got to be brought together. And then, of course, we've got the humanist and secular argument which says, look, 30% of schools are church schools, but only about 7% of the population are active uh, church goers. So isn't it a bit of an anomaly? It also points, quite understandably, to the way in which the admission arrangements now, uh, in, in which uh, uh, people are suddenly becoming Christian just when it comes to their children reach the age of 11, uh, and there's therefore a whole lot of ways in which that's modeled, and I think the research on that is exceedingly good. Uh, so, so these are the kind of arguments the antithesis. Now, I want to say by way of synthesis, a very limited, not a very a limited view of church school. I want to say the arguments going back to the Human Rights Act. I think that when uh, John, uh, Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in that wonderful uh, book, The Politics of Hope, uh, said civilization hangs suspended from generation to generation by the gossamer strand of memory. If only one cohort of mothers and fathers fails to convey to its children what it has learned from its parents, then the great chain of learning and wisdom snaps. The guardians of human knowledge stumble only one time, therefore collapses the whole edifice of knowledge and understanding. The importance of that continuity and handing on of the best in the traditions that we have uh, inherited. So that is uh, what I want. But I think one has to say there are very strict conditions in which that can be the case. I think, and this was the case under the maintained system of the 44 Education Act, Catholic schools which were established were subject to uh, national inspection just as much as any other school. They were subject to local government inspection because they were maintained by the local uh, government. They had to maintain the standards that was uh, uh, true of all the different schools in terms of what they taught and so on. There were particular areas of the curriculum, like the humanities, with members of the Humanities Curriculum Project, uh, great projects in the 1970s, in which there was a Catholic version of that agreed by the schools council at the time. The schools have to be viable. One of the problems about the creating of a Muslim school in Oxford is would it be viable? Would there be enough people going to it? in order to have a balanced curriculum right across the board, with the resources in science and what have you. So it's got to be viable. It's, it's, not, not, it's got to be such that it doesn't prevent social cohesion. And one can see how in certain areas of the country, and one goes back to the Usley report, how you could say, well, no, to, to have them uh, sectional schools, religious-based schools, could itself be part of the problem as indeed you might say it is in Northern Ireland. And I've done work in Porter Down in Northern Ireland and so on there, where they've created integrated schools because the different Catholics and the Protestants there rejected the idea of separate schools because they see that was part of the kind of problems around the notorious Porter Down sort of area. So the notion of social cohesion would seem to say, look, we do need to bring people together in this common school in certain areas. 
And then there is the admissions arrangement. And I do, uh, and I do, uh, would like, I know the Catholic Education Services here, is to be able to unravel for me some of the sort of statistics behind the admissions debate. I think a lot of the admissions to all the church schools together, and I do not know to what extent the Catholic schools are also uh, the cause of some of the real problems uh, on the distorted admissions, where the middle class, the pushing parents, the ones with cars and so on, can get their kids to certain schools, thereby denying places in those schools for people round about, and there's quite a lot of stuff like that. So that's what I want to say. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Therefore, faith schools, but with very strict conditions. Thank you very much.